Okay, in this uh, lecture we're going to be discussing a specific type of organization of social groups, a uh, type known as bureaucracies. Um, and this was largely a lot of these uh, initial thoughts about uh, the characteristics and description of bureaucracies uh, were talked about quite a bit by uh, a sociologist we talked about in Module 1, Max Weber. Um, basically, Weber said that uh, when a social group has progressed to the point where it uh, demonstrates these characteristics, we can consider it a bureaucracy. Okay? And we'll discuss those characteristics uh, before uh, we get to some of the ramifications of that. Basically, Weber said that an organization uh, that follows the rules of a bureaucracy has very clear levels. In other words, uh, the organization is organized from top to bottom with very specific layers or levels within them and that these uh, layers are distinguished from one another very clearly and that within this organization accountability flows up. So in other words, uh, the people at this level are accountable to the people above uh, them, who are accountable to the people above them um, all the way up to the top of the bureaucracy, and that work, tasks, or assignments then flow down. So in other words, this person tells this person what to do, tells this person what to do, and so forth, and then the accountability goes back up. So when Again, your boss who's above you in a bureaucracy tells you what to do and you complete the task, you just don't stay quiet about it or go home or anything like that. Then you have to turn around and tell your boss that you've got that task completed and he or she then tells the people above him or her that that task got completed. So once again, what uh, Weber said is that within a bureaucracy there's very clear levels in which accountability flows up and tasks and work flow down. Um, Within a bureaucracy, there's a very specific division of labor. So uh, there are different jobs, tasks, assignments, and that people within this division of labor have very specific tasks that they accomplish within that bureaucracy. And generally, and sometimes there's very strong restrictions against them performing other tasks other than what's assigned to them. So uh, if I use a hack as an example, we could say that there's clearly a division of labor uh, here at the college. Um, I have a specific task which I complete, which is instruction in sociology. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to come into hack and say, I don't feel like teaching today. I think I'll go run the floor buffers or I will uh, go mow the lawns outside um, and swap places with another person. Uh, even within, the, you could say that's kind of ridiculous, swapping places with a groundskeeper or, or a janitor. Uh, but even within uh, faculty, I would not be able to walk in and say to my office mate, perhaps, say, I don't feel like teaching sociology. I'll teach your psych class. You teach my sociology class. Okay? Um, we have very specific tasks within this division of labor, and we are assigned to do specific uh, tasks or assignments only. Um, Weber also said that within a bureaucracy, there are very strong written rules. Okay? So... Again, many of you have experienced this. On your first day at a new job, you're probably going to be handed a employee handbook or standard operating procedures or uh, you know, a to-do list or, or whatever else it is, but that uh, the, um, uh, again, it'll make very clear what the accountability is. When we'll talk about a hierarchy or uh, an organizational chart that tells you who your bosses or assignments are what your jobs and responsibilities are, who you report to, uh, all those other kind of things with that idea of written rules. And many times then in the course of your completing your assignments or doing your job, you may be confused by something and maybe go to your uh, boss and say, you know, boss, I don't understand how to do this or that. And again, hopefully your boss is a very nice person and wants to help you out. But in a lot of cases, more often than not, if they're not in a good mood or not a particularly nice person, the answer you'll probably get is, it's in the manual. Check the manual. That's all you need to know, right? So within a bureaucracy, very, very, very uh, direct and written rules. Um, to go along with that is the idea of written communication and records. So within a bureaucracy, um, everything is written down. So your boss will not come to you, just stick his or her head 
in your office or in, over your cubicle wall and just verbally tell you to do something. Uh, in the old days, it was, didn't you get the memo? Today, of course, we're much more likely to say, didn't you get the email? Okay, but that all assignments, again, the assignments that are flowing down are going to come to you in written form and when you then in turn complete your task and want to make sure that everybody knows that you did that, you will then write down your results or attach it or send it up in written form uh, as your measure of accountability. Uh, and also that all that communication, the tasks, assignments, everything done, is going to be kept. So once again, you can kind of say in the old days, if you thought about a big organization like a school or a business or government, there were rooms and rooms and rooms full of file cabinets with just you know archives and archives of, of, of old files, right? And now again, we think about uh, how businesses, organizations have to spend uh, lots and lots and lots of resources on file space. So we talk about you know mega gigabytes or you know. Huge amounts of space used to uh, keep things electronically nowadays, but that for the most part, bureaucracies uh, keep records of pretty much everything for a long period of time. Um, and the last two, again, characteristics that Weber described uh, as characteristics of bureaucracies uh, is the idea that bureaucracies uh, can be characterized as being very impersonal. In other words, uh, very little of what we would call individual. Um, kind of psyche or uh, personality uh, is needed in a bureaucracy, or as I should say is important to the bureaucracy, uh, that you know, for the most part you'll hear these complaints uh, by workers, and you might have felt this way yourself sometimes, I'm just a number in this organization, a uh, small fish in a big pond, just a cog in a machine, okay, these are all the things that, um, again, the bureaucracy is not necessarily interested in your uh, uh, individual characteristics, just your ability to get the job done. And then with that goes a high degree of replaceability. Uh, in other words, in a bureaucracy, because of this very strong division of labor and very specific tasks, nobody in the bureaucracy is so important that the bureaucracy can't exist without that person. And again, we tend to think about that as being the lower levels where we would maybe expect a high degree of turnover and thinking about large jobs, uh, large corporations, that kind of stuff. But it exists on every level, including schools, voluntary organizations. But that also goes up to the very top of the organization, that in a bureaucracy, even the people at the top are replaceable. So if I say to you, uh, we talk specifically about who is Steve Jobs, and you can say he was the founder of uh, Apple, well, and then he passed away, but the day he passed away, Apple Computers did not fold. It did not just shut down and say, well, our founder is no longer here. Clearly, organized like a bureaucracy, even the people at the very top are replaceable. Okay? So these are the characteristics that Weber said uh, made up a bureaucracy. And Weber, very much uh, kind of in line with the functional view of society, uh, was very much in favor of this. As a matter of fact, he described this uh, and the fact that more and more and more organizations uh, within uh, modern society were starting to become more and more organized into this uh, idea of bureaucracies. And Weber, once again, being a big fan of this, actually used the term, or used the term, uh, the rationalization of society. So in other words, as society becomes more ordered, uh, makes more, in his mind, sense and um, uh, falls into a more structured uh, way of organizing itself, uh, that more organizations would fall on this, this, this uh, description of bureaucracies, and he felt that was a good thing. Um, I then often challenge students to come up with examples of, you know, is every organization in society a bureaucracy? And challenge some people to come up with some examples of organizations in society that are not, because it's so easy to think of the ones that are. Clearly, like I said, hack is a bureaucracy. Uh, you know, if you're a nursing student and plan to work at a hospital someday, you will absolutely be working in a bureaucracy. If you plan to work for a, a large company, a corporation, you're working in a bureaucracy. Um, even many secondary organizations uh, fall in line of bureaucracy. So once again, if you're a member of the PTA or uh, you belong 
to a church, synagogue, a mosque that has uh, some type of council on it. You know, again, these rules will definitely apply to those types of organizations and you'll find yourselves engaging in many, many bureaucracies. But are all organizations bureaucracies? Typically not, when we think of, like, the, like I said, the family, uh, the most generalized type of family, we tend to not think about it. We might say that there are levels as far as parents versus children. Certainly you can say that certain people within the family are more likely to do some tasks than others. Um, but again, ignore you know, your mother leaving you sticky notes about doing the dishes or anything like that. We typically don't think of the typical family as having a huge set of written rules uh, or a handbook that they have to follow, uh, that people are much more likely just to talk to each other without writing everything down or keeping the records. And certainly, the idea of impersonability and replaceability doesn't exist in what we typically call a family situation. Whereas if a person, uh, the father of the family, passes away, dies, leaves, whatever else it is, we just don't say, oh, it's time to get a new dad, or let's put out an ad for a new dad, right? It's, it's going to be much more of a situation of personability and irreplaceability. So we typically think of families as not being organized. Uh, sometimes I say, okay, what else? And, uh, you know, like a, let's say, let's talk about a little corner store, a small business, a mom and pop grocery. Okay, once again, uh, you'll probably see that in that type of environment, everybody does everybody else's jobs. One person's working in a register while the other person is stocking shelves. But if a truck comes rolling in, then they might switch jobs. And everybody kind of does their own thing. They're much more likely just to talk to each other as far as getting things done, not having to keep a lot of records. Um, and once again, if the, you know, one, one of the two people in a, like I said, a mom and pop grocery mom or pop uh, passes away or dies or leaves, uh, the business is probably in some type of jeopardy. Then I say, well, what happens if mom and pop now buy another store and then turn it into a small chain? Well, what's going to happen? Now we're going to see the establishment of a bureaucracy. So whereas in the past it may have been kind of informal, everybody doing everything, as that business grows and becomes more organized, and this is exactly what Weber pointed to, uh, becomes more rational, then the need for clear levels, division of labor, written rules and communication, uh, and a greater degree of impersonability and replaceability are probably going to exist, and we're going to see a bureaucracy form. Um, okay, so there's a couple characteristics of bureaucracies that we can talk about here. Uh, one is the idea of perpetuation. Uh, this is the idea that bureaucracies tend to take on a life of their own. Once a bureaucracy has been established and gets set in motion, it's usually pretty difficult not only to keep the bureaucracy from going on and on and on, uh, but also a lot of times when a bureaucracy, even uh, those bureaucracies which are organized for the purposes of achieving a goal, even if that goal is met, the bureaucracy is not very likely just to stop working or to go away. Okay, um, that once, like I said, once once they're in motion, they tend to take on a life of their own and just continue. A uh, famous example of this, again, I've, I've often talked about in class. I ask uh, students if they're familiar with the March of Dimes, and most people have heard of it. And then I usually say, uh, Do you know what the March of Dimes was formed to do or accomplish? And Maybe less people will know this, but the idea is that the March of Dimes originally formed as an organization dedicated to uh, raising money to funnel toward research for a cure for polio. Um, again, the early part of the 20th century, polio is a very serious disease. Many, many, many thousands of people, uh, including at one time uh, the President of the United States, um, was stricken with polio. And many, many people died of it. It was a, it was a, a very significant childhood illness for many people, um, and it was pretty rare that a person living in the 20s, 30s, and even the 40s and 50s uh, didn't know somebody with polio who was suffering from this uh, 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 serious disease. So the March of Dimes was organized as a research uh, foundation uh, to, like I said, raise and funnel money, and they were very successful at it. As a matter of fact, Jonas Salk came up with a vaccination for polio, and if you think about polio today, you probably don't know anybody with polio. Uh, polio has largely been uh, considered to have been cured for a very long period of time, and even those people who were somehow stricken with polio, uh, there's an effective vaccination for dealing with it. 
So we could largely say that the March of Dimes cured polio through their efforts. Um, now what happened after Jonas Salk uh, invented that vaccine? Did the people uh, who worked at the March of Dimes show up and told to go home? Congratulations everybody, we did it, we're done. <laughs> you know. Now, uh, the March of Dimes then said, okay, what now are we gonna focus our energy on? The bureaucracy is in place. We have, uh, again, all these levels and, and mechanisms in place. So uh, the March of Dimes decided to focus on reducing birth defects, uh, which again, a lot of people know it for today. And were once again very, very successful in the latter half of the 20th century. The March of Dimes, uh, and through its, largely its efforts and its uh, ability to raise money and, and uh, fund research, um, did a very uh, admirable job of greatly reducing, not only in the United States, but some other countries around the world, the rate of birth defects. Okay? Um, so once again, nearly put itself out of business twice. Uh, uh, if you were to read the, uh, the charter or the mission statement of the March of Dimes today, it largely says that it raises money to fund medical breakthroughs, which when you think about it is kind of brilliant because when is the last medical breakthrough going to occur? So you can take a, a, a lesson from this and that the, what the March of Dimes learned uh, is not to make your goals so specific that you can actually achieve them, that you know by just now funneling money and, you know, toward uh, medical breakthroughs, the March of Dimes can now exist basically in perpetuity. It will exist as long as uh, the society exists and as long as it can continue uh, to uh, justify its existence. Okay? Some of the other things we can talk about is characteristics of bureaucracies are some of the dysfunctions which might be associated with bureaucracies, okay? Once again, we talked about functional view, uh, and we talked about, uh, again, in Weber's case, some of the positive functions of a bureaucracy. Um, clearly, we could also say that for everything that has functions, they also have dysfunctions. Uh, so what are some of the dysfunctions we can associate with uh, bureaucracies? One is the idea of sometimes call, and hopefully you've heard this term before, red tape. Okay, what is red tape? Uh, we usually associate it with um, things being more difficult than they need to. Okay, I've, I've often used the example of, has anyone ever lost their driver's license? I mean, physically lost it, like you can't find it in your wallet, your purse, uh, whatever else it is, you must have misplaced it or fell out somewhere, or you put it down and can't remember where it is. Well. It's pretty much an easy thing just to go down to the DMV, walk in there and say, hey, I need a new license, and they print it right up for you, correct? Of course not. We all know that that is ridiculous, that you would need to prepare yourself to go into the DMV, and people will tell you, if you say you're going to get your license, they'll say, remember to bring uh, proof of residence, a piece of mail with your name on it, make sure you have your birth certificate, and we can actually say, make sure it's not a copy of your birth certificate, you need your original birth certificate with the raised seal on it, uh, two other forms of ID, you know, proof of residency, all these other kind of things to justify uh, who you are to get that replacement license. But the twist I throw in there is, what if your mother works at the DMV? So uh, you know that your mother works there, and you know she's working that day, and you walk in and say, Mom, I need a new license. Is your mom clearly just going to be able to turn around and say, you got it, honey, and hit the button on the machine that prints out a brand new one. Um, no, your mother will need to demand to see your printed birth certificate with the raised seal on it. Uh, again, I make the joke a lot of time. Your mother was there when that document was created. Uh, who better in the world to be able to say, that is my son or daughter. Uh, of course, I can use my own judgment in verifying their, uh, their uh, identity uh, and issuing a new license. The idea of red tape is exactly that kind of that application of the rules without what we sometimes call a notion of common sense. That workers are sometimes so bound, not only, like I said, by the rules, the written rules that exist in a bureaucracy, but also that a sense of accountability that they could get in a lot of trouble if they don't follow the rules, that their ability to use their own direction or common sense 
uh, is sometimes pretty limited. Um, another person, a lot of times when we talk about Weber, and Weber says one thing, we can pretty much count on the idea that Karl Marx probably disagrees, and in this case, that is a pretty good example. Uh, Karl Marx, um, again, an economist uh, dealing a lot with uh, the Industrial Revolution and uh, what he considered to be the plight of workers. And of course, for a lot of the workers that he was discussing and concerned with, worked in organizations that were arranged as bureaucracies. So whereas Weber considered bureaucracies to be, a, again, a positive boon to society, uh, the rationalization of society, uh, Marx pointed out some of the, the big problems with democracies. And one of the things he pointed out was this notion of alienation that people who work within bureaucracies uh, often, as we talked about before, kind of feel more like uh, machines than they do people. Uh, one of the examples uh, that's often given in, uh, when we talk about this is uh, the idea of, let's talk about uh, producing a chair. Okay? Um, is there a big difference in the way that a craftsman produces a chair as opposed to a factory worker producing a chair? A craftsman, kind of like a small business owner or that mom and pop grocer we talked about, is much more likely to design a chair in a completely different way than a factory worker uh, would be instrumental in producing a chair. So a craftsman would probably come up with a design in his or her head, uh, choose the wood, cut it, measure it, uh, shape each of the pieces, put them together, uh, test it out, and at the very end, the craftsperson is probably going to look at that chair and feel a sense of pride. Uh, accomplishment that you know uh, that this is uh, the product of his or her labor and feel um, very attached and that was what Marx talked about when he talked about alienation it's kind of the absence of that a distance from work think about how a, a factory worker puts a chair together so if you arrive at the chair factory and your job is leg number three installer so you go to your specific workstation in a big bin, you have leg number three, and in front of you is a conveyor belt, and the chair seats are rolling down, and it is your job to specifically put one leg in each chair as it rolls by. And that would be your job all day long, installing leg number three. And at the end of the day, the end of the eight, 10 hour, 12 hour work day, however long it is, if you were shown a room full of the finished chairs, the idea, according to Marx and his theory of alienation, is those workers will not feel anything toward those chairs. As a matter of fact, they may actually feel a sense of hostility uh, toward the work that they have to do and, and this feeling of uh, not being invested or uh, in any way kind of contributing uh, toward this. And that's the idea of alienation. Um, we can often see that sometimes workers combat this idea of alienation through a process we call resistance. Uh, so once again, we talk about sometimes we talk about large corporations and workers feeling like they don't belong. Um, workers do all sorts of things to try to, uh, uh, I often, uh, to combat this, this notion of alienation. I sometimes use, okay, if you're going to show up for your first day at a big corporation and you know your workspace is going to be something of a cubicle or a small office, What's usually the first thing that workers do? Individualize it, personalize it, put up pictures of family and your favorite sports teams and your little knickknacks and troll dolls all over the place. Again, what is the purpose of that? It's not, to, uh, to, it's not directly related to your productivity, but you are attempting to individualize your workspace. You are attempting to make it yours, uh, to feel a sense of belonging there, that if you were just sitting at a plain cubicle with nothing on the walls, uh, you would feel much more like that of kind of a robot or a number or a cog in a machine. Um, so that is that sense of alienation. Um, the last thing that we can talk about is a possible and, and frequently discussed uh, dysfunction. Is the notion of incompetence. Uh, that sometimes within a bureaucracy, um, merit or your ability to accomplish tasks is not necessarily as important as understanding the inner workings of the bureaucracy. So uh, for people who occupy positions in a bureaucracy and understanding how the bureaucracy works 
and what the rules are and who's accountable to who, that sometimes that um, guarantees a person either a position or sometimes advancement in the bureaucracy as opposed to that idea of being able to reliably accomplish tasks. Um, sometimes we talk about that idea of people can rise in a bureaucracy to the level of their own incompetence. The joke kind of being that some people are better at understanding the bureaucracy than they are at actually doing their jobs. And sometimes I'm sure many people who maybe have operated already in bureaucracies can sometimes uh, kind of, you know, if you think about, you know, you've complained about the idea that my boss couldn't do my job, you know, but yet they are my boss. And you could probably say, how did that person get to that level that is above me when they clearly couldn't do the job that I do? Well, part of the explanation could be, again, that idea is that person understands the bureaucracy more than they uh, assume or can um, be relied on to do the specific tasks that are required. Okay? Um, and again, that's the notion of incompetence. So we clearly see that there's two ways of looking at this, uh, clearly in favor, uh, the champion of bureaucracies, uh, and describing them and laying out for us the characteristics of them and calling it the rationalization of society, as well as some of the uh, other concerns about uh, bureaucracies within a society.